two, one. Welcome to From the Valley Pod- From the Valley Podcast, Brisbane Business Life. I'm your host Tim Wilshire. This is episode ninety eight of the series, and uh, today I've got uh, an interesting fella, uh, Stephen Everett. Uh, Steve, from uh, you obviously uh, represent a few different hats, but uh, uh, tell us some of the businesses that you're in, associated with here in Brisbane. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, okay, well, the the one that you would know, uh, which I've been associated with for the longest, is Belvedere Share Managers, yep. which is private equities portfolio management, but um, but a busy twelve months. So in that twelve months, um, I've partnered up with uh, another financial planning firm. It's called Aspect Wealth Advisors, and we've launched a, a lending arm, um, which is called First Capital Lending, and um, in addition to that. I've been working on a a startup tech firm, which is called Frugal, which is a a money-saving tool um, that's really starting to gain some traction. So things are busy. So Frugal is a money-saving tool, did you say? So is it like um, looking at different expenses and working ways to cut them down and that sort of thing? Yes, um, we've actually designed it. The the theory behind it is to be so simple to use that you can't help but use it. Um, Mm. And it basically, it drills down on the money that we spend every day on, on essentially sort of rubbish, you know, the things that we could probably do without, um, yep. you know, might, might be buying a couple of extra coffees a day. Um, so it highlights those things and then extrapolates that out and tells the, the user what could be if they were to uh, cut back a little on that stuff. Okay. So a few different things going on. Okay. Just to, to sort of uh, a bit of background for the listeners, whereabouts, Steve, were you born and where did you sort of grow up early in life? Well, I am a North Queenslander. So I was born in a little town called Ayr, which is about an hour's yep. drive south of Townsville. Yep. A cane farming town. And at two, uh, we moved to Townsville and um, mum and dad, dad was pretty entrepreneurial. And um, he set up a, well, at one stage they had six independent used car dealerships. Uh, so the family was the, the largest privately owned used car dealers in North Queensland at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, yeah, we, uh, I don't know, for some, for some strange reason, Dad one day decided that we were going to start a barramundi farm. So we did that from scratch as well. Um, but back to, to childhood stuff, I was schooled at um, Charters Towers at a place called All Souls St. Gabriel School, a country boarding school, which was the best years of my life. Great fun. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, and what sort of, uh, I guess, growing up, what sort of, did you get involved in sports and that sort of thing uh, as a youngster? I wasn't particularly sporting. So, um, when it came to playing footy and things, I was generally worse than a man down. And cricket, well, you know, I may as well be trying to hit a marble. Uh, I'm no good. But golf, golf was my thing. Um, played a little rugby league and, uh, and swimming. I was a, a pretty strong swimmer. Okay. Uh, how old were you when you first started playing golf? That would have been, I would have been in grade six when I started playing in juniors yep. um, at, a, at Willows Golf Club in Townsville. So our, our house backed onto the, the, the 18th tee, 17th green. Okay. Which, which golf course was that, sorry? It's called the Willows. At the time, it was owned by Ian Baker Fitch, but um, I don't know who owns it now. It's sold off a few... Oh, geez, a while ago now. Um, but yeah, good good course, great course now. They spent a fair bit of money doing it up. Um, it's on the on the bank of the Bolly River. Okay, so, uh, and you mentioned uh, swimming. You, you're a pretty good swimmer. Swimming was my, the, uh, the sport I was best at. Um, and uh, swam club for, oh, geez, five or six years as a kid and then sort of gave it away. But that's transitioned now into, into surfing. So I surf most weekends, um, a couple of times during the week, if you can, if I can get down there. Mm. The, uh, the, golf, the golf all stemmed from, because we had that house on the golf course, it was like a halfway house for the up and coming pro golfers. In fact, um, there was a fellow, his name was Simon Brown. He lived with us for years. And he was a really, really handy golfer and could have, could have easily gone pro, but he um, uh, didn't didn't pass the tour school, missed the cup by one shot, and then sort of gave it away after that, which was a bit sad. But I remember one day playing golf with him and Adam Scott when I was about 13 years old, back when Adam was still um, playing at Interpilly Golf Club as like a up and coming. 
So, and so how, how many years ago would that have been? So that would have been 1996, 97. Yeah, because, yeah, Adam sort of, when did he make his, sort of made his splash sort of around 2005, maybe onto the scene, around about when he first became pretty, when was it when he became sort of um, pretty popular initially? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was around then because the Indrapilly Golf Club had a really cool, um, like a an, an encouragement sort of grooming program. So the the guys that had the ability to be handy golfers would go and play there and they'd get jobs as groundkeepers during the day and they'd have sort of open access to the course and practice and coaching. Um, so that would make sense because it would have been a few years after that that he really started taking off. Yeah, Indrapilly is always a good course. I mean... You know, 36 holes, lots of different layouts. Um, you played many games on that over the years? It's been a, it's been a long time since I played in Drove, but um, I always remember it being just everything about it was just pristine. Um, mm, a lot of the yeah. It's, um, it's, it's very nice. You've got a lot of those holes that are sort of along the river or some holes along the river and different water um, holes as well. It's a yeah, beautiful course. Um, Going back to younger days again, um, so a bit of golf, obviously good at swimming. Um, what about, can you remember what uh, your first job was, your first uh, your first part-time job when you were a teenager? My first part-time job was, uh, during the week, was washing cars at the car yard, which is fun in Townsville when it's 36 degrees and 95% humidity. <laughs> no. And, and uh, on the weekends, it was at the, working at the Barra Farm. Yeah, so um, washing cars and, and all that sort of stuff. Any what are the, those sort of first jobs? What are, what are some of the sort of lessons that you you learnt, I guess, in those early years that, that sort of that you remember uh, that have sort of stuck through and helped you sort of, uh, I guess, your you know your career path, you know, over since you were an adult. I'd say the standout would be that. Um there are always going to be days that are really awful where you just mm. hate your job and you don't yeah. want to do it anymore. But mm. unless you power through them, you'll spend a lifetime having those sort of days because it's not until you power through sort of six or 12 months of, and I'm not talking in, in you know, I'm talking collectively over a couple of years, you got to really go through six or 12 months of really crappy days before you start to get traction in any business. Um, I mean, for example, this uh, this frugal app. It's been three years of just hard yards, talking to people, you know, trying to script together a bit of money here and there to build a website or get some, you know, um, development work done, and then you scrimp away again for a little bit longer. And at the start, when we, we when I first started talking about it, I had some guys working with me, and you know. Um, it was sort of three months in and we hadn't really got any traction. And next thing I've, I'm, I'm working away and I've got this Google Hangouts chat sort of happening in the corner of my screen. And I can see these two guys talking and they're talking and they're sharing pictures of chateaus in France. And, oh, when we, you know, when this app kicks off, we're going to buy this chateau and isn't this lovely? And I'm thinking, oh, no, I've got the wrong guys. <laughs> they don't realise how much hard work is in front of us before they'll be talking about chateaus in France. So, Parker, yeah. Up. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I guess Bill Vidy, that's you said. How, how long you, has that been going on for? Uh, quite a while, I think you said. Yeah, it's uh, it'll be just on five years now. They've been working for Belvedere. I mean, the company itself has been around for thirty years. Um, yeah. And when I say company, it's it's really you know myself and one other guy um, who's yeah. been running it for the thirty. But, um, yeah, it's, I mean, that's been challenging times now, particularly with, with the, the market having performed as it has uh, due to COVID. One of the surprising things, though, I kind of... This, well, this is the first crash I've ever experienced from a, you know, financial... You know, being in the financial industry. Mm. And um, I, w- I was sort of expecting people to be more panicked, but... They haven't been. A lot of people have just sort of rung me and said, oh, yeah, well, it is what it is. And let us know when, when you want us to transfer some more money to invest and take advantage of the bottom. I, I was surprised. Anyway, I didn't think it was going to go that way at all. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, I mean, obviously, uh, the GFC that obviously had a big, huge impact on the share market uh, back in two thousand and eight uh, and two thousand and nine. You know, seven, eight, and nine. That that was obviously a pretty treacherous time for the stock market. And obviously, we're just a, we're seeing quite a lot uh, of uh, activity in the share market over the last couple of years. Obviously, a huge increase in the share market value, um, and it, to a really peak sort of uh, feel at December just gone uh, 2019 where you had the all ordinaries up around 7,200 I think it was as high as that mm. and um, and then it sort of uh, got to as low as 45, 4,600 back up around the mid fives again it sort of j- jumps away it's so volatile isn't it the sheer market it has been it's interesting that you say that December had a real um, sort of top feel about it like peak feel because I must admit I had the, I had the same same feeling and you're not the first person that have said that to me. Um, so it's, it's interesting how it played out. I mean, notwithstanding this COVID thing, it's been more like a black swan event, but it's just interesting that it still managed to play out the way that everyone's gut feel said it was going to. Yeah, it's it's certainly, it's, it's pretty hard to predict. The cheer market, is, to me, uh, I hate, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an analytical thinker a lot of the time. I'm, you know, an accountant tax agent. Um, and I like to... It's, I, I could never predict exactly what's going to happen in, in something like the share market. So people investing in the share market, or you can really, you know, from what Jeff Kumnick, who, who, who works next door, what he's often said is, um, you know, it's obviously a long-term strategy. Things go up over, you know, t- over time, long-term. So you're going to have these volatile moments, but you've got to look at the, you know, obviously a, a longer period of time. So um, is I guess getting involved in in that sort of industry, if we want to touch on it, um, what have you sort of learnt from when you started there at um, at Belvedere, and what what have you sort of, I mean, what what's a day what's day to day sort of work look like for you when you're working with the, these guys? Well, the the biggest lesson I learned is that I'm not a share trader, like as in. You know, you talk to these guys and they, oh, I bought this morning at, you know, $10 and I sold this afternoon at 12 and that's not me. Because I think I, I probably share that quality you just mentioned that you've got, which is that analytical sort of process thinker. So by the time I've, by the time I've done enough due diligence that I'm comfortable with something, it's, um, it's certainly not a, not a short-term trade um, prospect. Um, notwithstanding, there, there has been some times where, um, you know, um, you'll turn the screens on in the morning and the open will happen and a stock that you own jumps up 10 or 15% on, on really nothing. And you think, well, this is nothing other than just sentiment driven and people punt trading. So I'll take advantage of this and I'll, I'll sell and I'll buy it back later. And, and those sort of things work. Um, but as a day to day, it's, it's really just a lot of reading and a lot of talking research, to people, yeah. research, um, and some of the best research is just talking to, to guys in the industry, guys like you who, you know, are in business and you understand it. And you say, oh, what do you think about this? And what do you think of this industry? Oh, well, Steve, I've actually got a client and he's got a business that's, about, that's in that industry yep. and he thinks mm. things are going really well. Oh, okay, cool. Gives you some insights then where you can, mm. you know, start to unpack it a little bit. Um, I think, um, you know, I think the share market has been, particularly in the last sort of two, three years when, everyone's got such easy access to, to trading stocks through your phone or you know, people forget that you're actually buying, you're buying a little portion of an actual business that's got staff and it's got, you know, dramas and um, good days and bad days and electricity bills and, you know, all the things that go with that, that any small business experience all the time. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's it certainly has that uh, thing that you got to obviously think about all of that. When uh, when you're looking at trying to build relate you know relationships as well to be able to help you you know be able to understand what's going on in different uh, businesses and situations in the economy and uh, how things all sort of fit together so it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I noticed uh, one one of one of your good friends is a good friend of mine also I should have, I haven't had him on the podcast yet but he he'd be probably a good guest and that's um, uh, Kieran Hall from Murph Law. Um, you, you and Kieran know each other quite well, don't you? I think. Yes, he would be a great addition t- to your podcast. He's, um, yeah, he's the depth of his knowledge is is um, it's something that I 
it astounds me all the time, just the, the random things that he comes up with that are, you know, really quite insightful. It'd be perfect. But yeah, Kieran and I are, uh, are good mates. Yeah, good. I remember, yeah, I had an example where he saved one of my clients for, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars last year in a situation. So uh, very, very smart, very, very knowledgeable, especially in, in the space of, um, you know, estate planning, self planning super funds, that sort of thing. So he's, and he's also put, he's put a nice little um, recommendation on your uh, LinkedIn page there. He's, he basically says, Steve's so entertaining. He's a regular welcome addition to our uh, Friday night afternoon drinks at Murphy Law. Uh, he's always learning and discovering, etc. He's a knockabout guy and he cares for his friends and clients, obviously. Uh, he, he encourages anybody to seek you out for a yarn, a beer, and some fair, some fair income tips. <laughs> well, where that's where that stemmed from is for almost three, it would have been better than three years. I actually rented, he had a spare office in their firm and, um, and his business partner, Steve Grant, yes. um, he, he and my boss, David Manchi from Belvedere, when they were graduates, both worked, I think at City Bank or something together when they were like 20, you know, in their early twenties. Um, so you can imagine as you do when you're a graduate working in the business, you make some long-term mates and you run a muck and do some drinking. And, and, um, and so, yeah, when, when I first started, he said, Oh, Dave called me one day and he said, Oh, how you find it working from home? I said, Oh, it's, you know, it's got its days, but kind of sucks mostly. And I, I need, you know, wouldn't mind getting some interaction. So we did a deal with Kieran and Steve and I rented that office space. So for three years, I was like this quasi, member of the Murtha Law team. They called me Friday Steve. Well that's a good so to show yeah, Friday. Good reputation for, you know, socially that's that's good to sort of I think people when it comes to things like Friday night drinks, I think that's something that you lose touch a little bit over the years. I mean in a suburban firm like we are, we should we should be having, you know, Friday night drinks pretty much every Friday. It just doesn't happen though. You, everyone just gets to the end of the week and says, Oh fuck, time to go home. I want to go home and and the family or, you know, whatever. It's, it's, you, what do you think of this sort of Friday night drinks sort of feel? Is it something that you feel that is like something that we should be doing every week or is it something that where you say, okay, let's just do it once a month? No, I think we should do it every week. I mean, one of the things that I learned just from, you know, my time hanging out in, at Kieran's office mm. is yeah. the, team were as, the team were as tight as tight. And, you know, they, they were all mates and they caught up, you know, outside of work. And now I, I tend to think that we've, and we've done it to ourselves because we've got, you know, we've got emails on our phone and we've got this happened and that happened and we're so damn busy all the bloody time that we don't make that half an hour in the afternoon to, to have a beer and sort of call that. Because as a, you know, when I was younger and working in different industries, that was always kind of the full stop for the week. You know, all right, right, boys, it's five o'clock, crack a beer, have a chat, talk about the footy on the weekend. And, um, you know, that was, um, that was the sign-off. So, no, I think, it, I think it's a good addition. They should bring it back. Yeah, no, they should keep it. I mean, I, I think it's always something. I mean, I, I sort of wasn't saying it was Friday night drinks, but I did have a couple of beers last Friday. I just felt like it was, it was one of those weeks where it was just a bit draining and you got to the no, normal draining in a way. And you, when you got to the end of that week, that's all, all, all I could think about was just having a beer to just to uh, not so much soothe any pains, but to um, just to quench the, where we're at, you know, with, with everything else going on in the world at the moment with, you know, with the COVID situation working remotely a lot of the time going in and out of the office a bit and, and, you know, the demand that's been put on accounts with all these different things going on with job keeper and, cash flow boosts and all that sort of stuff. It's yeah, it be was <laughs> definitely welcome, yeah, this time last week. So I might I'll i I'm, I'm hoping I'll probably have a beer, you know, sooner or later anyway, but um tonight. But so we'll see what happens. Um yeah, but but um you also you have you had you said your your parents were involved in all those sort of car dealerships back in the day when you were young and growing up and that sort of thing. You, you've also been involved in that industry as well, haven't you, I think? Yeah, my, fir my first job that wasn't under the, in the family business was a junior salesperson at Zupp's Holden Mount Cravat, um, which, which in the day was like, if you, you know, that was the prestige Holden dealership in, in Brisbane. Is that still um, there, mate? Is it still there at Aspley? 
The one at Ashby's still there and Niagara still there too. Um, yep. But I don't know what's going to happen now that Poland yep. pulled the pin. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I imagine they're going to have to try and find another franchise to put in there. Um, but but that was um, that was my baptism of, of fire into the into the working world. One of the, um, at the time the one of the cars that was brand new was a was a Holden Astra, and it had a feature where you could. Um, this was back when you could like haze staff when they were new, particularly the young guys. And um, they had a feature where if you you press the lock button on the key twice really fast, it deadlocked the car. And so even yep. if you un you undid the lock from the inside, you couldn't get out. And so um, we're moving cars around the showroom one day, and tidying things up. And uh, one of the guys says, oh, can you quickly jump in here and shift this car? So I get in. So he reaches in the door and he grabs the keys out and shuts the door and deadlocks me in the car. Now, thankfully, it's in an air-conditioned showroom, but I was there for the day. So I think I spent about five and a half hours locked in this car <laughs> as, as customers would come into the showroom. <laughs> They'd bring them over to the car and go, hey, look, we've locked a junior in the car. <laughs> thank, thank God for Snake on a Nokia 8250. It was the only thing that kept me sane. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, what do you think of, I mean, uh, what, what do you sort of learned in that industry from, obviously, from your parents uh, when they had um, the dealerships and, and obviously then you've obviously been involved in working at dealerships as well. Um, what I mean, what sort of skills do you think were your strongest when it when it came to that industry? Like, were you sort of, did you sort of help with the I guess the sales marketing side of the of those businesses at all? Or? Well, I was I was a little young when um, with mum and dad stuff, but yeah. since after after working with Zups, um, dad and I opened our own car dealership down on the Gold Coast, which I had for a few years, and and um, sort of learned a bit there. Then I ran a Honda dealership for another mate of mine, like Honda motorbikes. But one of the biggest things that I learned from that industry was, um, you know, and I think, I think a lot of businesses these days, we get so caught up with things like, oh, what am I charging versus what someone else charging? Like cars and anything of that sort of nature, you would, you would know is very price driven. People are always saying, you know, well, how much cheaper can you do this car or this motorbike than the guy down the road? But it's not actually about that. In fact, if you just focus on looking after people and being a bit of a problem solver for them, because when they walk into a shop, they don't know what sort of car they want. They've got some idea. They might have seen something on the road or looked it up in a magazine at the time. Um, but if they've got particular desires or needs, they need someone who understands all of the products that are available to walk them through the bits and pieces so they can make an informed decision. And um, it, was, uh, it was a big lesson to me at the start when I first started selling cars and being a trainee, I thought it was all about price and, you know, we've got to be the cheapest or you're just not going to sell any product. And it wasn't until after a few years that I realised it's actually got very little to do with price. It's people, whilst price is important, people want to deal with someone that they can trust, that they have a relationship with, that they feel comfortable with. And if they throw a bit of a curly question or a problem at them, then they will go out of their way a little bit to find the answer rather than just, oh, that's too hard, mate. We'll just, you know, we'll just do this half-assed thing instead. Mm. That was my biggest takeaway by far. Yeah. So, obviously, it, as obviously you made some fairly uh, good connections over the course of your, um, you know, business career and that sort of thing and getting involved, uh, um, obviously, in, now into Belvedere and uh, obviously... Uh, what, tell us about, about networking generally. I mean, what do, what do you sort of, obviously you, you're known as a layabout sort of guy who likes to have a bit of a beer and a bit of a chat. Um, but what, what do you think are the best forms of networking and what are you sort of, uh, I guess, um, going forward, what do you think you're going to be doing, even though that may be hard to predict with what's going on? Um, well, I t it's funny because... In a conversational situation like this, I'm really comfortable. And if you and I were, were at the golf pro shop, or the, you know, the, the golf members bar, having a beer and having a chat, then, you know, no issue. But when we get to, if, if I was to go to like a networking drinks, I'm often yep. the guy that's sort of standing in the corner that doesn't really know how to engage anyone. Okay. Um, so that's, that's just a little nuance of, of mine. But as far as networking goes, I am really starting to learn now the value of um, 
you know, actually putting yourself out there on social media. I mean, social media these days is the old school business card that you would hand out to the people in your street or, you know, the people at the golf club or at the Sunday sesh with the watching the footy at the pub. But realistically, um, we've got these tools, these things like Facebook, LinkedIn, that allow us to broadcast to our network of, you know, contacts that this is what we do for a living. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to say, oh, well, if I'm going to invest some money or get a mortgage, I'm going to talk to Steve or, or that if I'm going to get some accounting done, I'm going to talk to Tim. But it's, it's still a, it's a good starting point because people like to deal with people that they know. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, if, if, they, if, if you broadcast who you are as in, you know, you don't have to, uh, and at the start, I thought that you had to portray a particular image on these social media platforms, you know, be, look to be the smartest and look to be the most professional, look to be all these things. Whereas now I think it's more about just look to be Steve or just look to be Tim mm. and, you know, broadcast that you've, yeah, I've got a family and I have a bit of fun and I like a beer and a chat and, um, you know, those sort of people that I guess share those values will just naturally gravitate to you if they want accounting done or if they want, you know, financial advice or something. Yeah, no, that's 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 uh, certainly fair. Um, I mean, golf is obviously a big love, and you've, obviously that's um, still, I guess, as, as far as hobbies are concerned, would that be number one at the moment? Yeah, it is. All especially now that we're allowed to do it again. Um, it was a bit hard there for a minute. We weren't allowed to. We get to. I mean, the Nudgy is my my home club, as you know. Yep. And um, yeah, it was closed, uh, which mm. sucks because I've just built this brand new. Golf course, that's awesome, and I haven't even had a chance to play it yet. Um, mm. I assume is Kapira your home club? No, no, I don't have really a home club per se. I'm more of a social golf player. I sort of go from one course to the other. I don't really want to tie myself down to one particular course. But <laughs> um, uh, Nudgy, I did play it a couple of months ago, and um, it was looking really, really good, all those new holes uh, right along the, um, the highway there. Fantastic what they've done there. Um, mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly nudge. I can I can see why people um, join that club. I mean, we've got some fairly good clubs. Uh, you know, we haven't got too many clubs to choose from, but you know, there's there's your um, nudge is certainly one that that you have to choose from. Um, you know, either Capera or Nudge or Virginia, really, uh, or all the way out, out to one teamer. Um, Norfolk is obviously gone, and um, you know that's that's a pretty much the only clubs that are on the north side. Um, but yeah, it's 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 good what they've done there, and um, I think one of the one of the reasons I sort of came across Brian Debert's um, golf page maybe was because of you. I'm just trying to remember if it was. I'm pretty sure uh, you know Brian because he's also a member of Nudgy as well. Um, he is, yeah, yeah. I played a few rounds with Brian. He's a great bloke. So I had him on the podcast about a month ago or thereabouts. Um, just because he he he's got a I love his um, Facebook page. Do you, you ever go there much and have a look? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, and he's he's worked really hard to build that up, and he's built what is you know a really good sort of contact base. Because um, oh, yeah. you know he, he's got even on his golf bag, he's got the Brian Debert um, embroidered on the golf bag, and yeah. I think um, I think he's got a pretty good relationship with that Forte as well, which make a really good ball. If you're looking for golf, yeah, he's, a, he's certainly a great, a very tall guy, great player, um, you know, and a very very nice, very nice guy, and. He comes across as being someone who's a professional. You know, he's just very—he's got that sort of mentality about him. And you, you know, I went through a phase about 10, 10 years ago, a bit like that, where I was—I was buying different clubs, buying a new driver, buying a new three wood, buying. I don't. I mean, I haven't probably spent money on the golf clubs. Probably bought one driver in the last six or seven years, um, and I've kept the same irons, I've kept the same woods. I've had them for you know six or seven years. Most of those with golf clubs, do you how often do you change yours over? Yeah. I've still got a, a set of Nike um, clubs that I bought in 2002. Uh, I have changed the driver because a friend of mine, um, we were, we were playing at Rabina one day, a good mate of mine, and he, he had this ping driver. And I, I was going through a stage where it didn't matter what I what I did, I couldn't hit my driver. It would just it would be a snap hook or these big block fades. It was disgusting. And um, he said, "I oh, give this ping 
a hit. And I've hit it, I've smashed it straight down the middle, like 260 meters or something, it's massive. Oh, this is nice club. So the next hole is like, oh, can I use that ping again? Same thing. And so um, anyway, we got to the end of the round and he said, oh, I said, mate, would you sell it? Because I can't hit my current one, I'm going to buy this off you. And um, so we did a deal, gave him the money. And then literally the next morning, I had another game of golf uh, at Nudgee uh, with a fellow named Peter Pavusa who works in Kieran's for Myrtle Law. And um, first tee, stood up, grabbed this ping. Oh, this is going to be awesome because we're hitting this thing so well. Yep, straight in the water. Hard right, ugliest shot you've ever seen in the water. Oh, okay, must be just a teething problem. Third hole, grab it out again. Uh, Big snap hook left into the bush. And <laughs> so I think the thing with golf clubs is they perform until you pay for them. As long as you can borrow <laughs> someone else's clubs, <laughs> they're fine. The moment you pay for them, they go to pieces on you. <laughs> yeah, it's fair, man. It's, yeah. I, I've, I mean, that's, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that, it's always hard to find those right clubs. I think you can, sometimes you just have to pay some money to experiment to, until you find something that might work a bit better. I mean, and, and as you and as you said, there's always that inconsistency. Sometimes it might start off being a good club for you, and then it, you know something happens, something changes, and all of a sudden you're just slicing the same club five times in a row. Um, mm. So it's it's yeah, it's a tough one to sort of master. That's for sure. Hitting you know playing golf, but I just love you know golf is just it's just great to know that it's always there. I think that you know. It's always there to play if, if you want to play a game of golf. You know, it's, it's there, and um, mm. really, really enjoy it uh, when I do get out there and play. So even though I don't play, I'm not a, not the sort of person who will play every week, or you know, I'm probably maybe playing once a month or thereabouts. So um, it's just enjoyable, enjoyable to. I used to, you know, I also used to follow it on TV too, quite quite heavily. I used to, you know, ten years ago, I used to sort of uh, watch it quite religiously most of the events and. And uh, what about you? Do you watch it on telly? Oh, I haven't for a while. I mean, we've got, uh, yeah. you know, my wife and I have got the, the two-year-old in the house, which keeps us busy. And, and then, um, you know, work's been, work's been a bit crazy for, oh, I'd have to say, coming on sort of six months now. So, you know, TV's, TV for us has been, um, you know, try and watch an episode of Better Call Saul or something for half an hour while you eat your dinner and then go back to... Um, go back to, to doing work or tidying the house up or picking up after the two-year-old. But I think one of the, um, one of the things I think is really um, underestimated for golf is, is how much of it's actually physical fitness. And you talked about Brian before. I noticed when, when he swings a club, you know, it, because he plays so much and he must train or something as well, but he's got this really sort of definite swing about him and uh, hits the ball a mile. It's a beautiful shot. Um, whereas if you don't have that that core strength and that physical fitness, I think that's where the the swaying comes into it, and you, that's when you tend to you know spray it. But um, so I identified through playing golf and and through sort of how sore I would get after a game. I thought oh, I really got to do something about the fitness here. This is uh, this is getting out of hand for a guy that's thirty six and feels like he's fifty six. Um, and started doing jujitsu, and I know you're into your your MMA and the jujitsu yeah. stuff is really fun. Uh, it's, uh, how long have you sort of been in, in? How long have you sort of been interested in um, mixed martial arts and jiu-jitsu? Then? Well, I've, I've dabbled in a few things um, for oh, since probably two thousand and eight, two thousand nine. I started getting into Muay Thai, kickboxing. Yep. And um, and then mainly for fitness, or did you actually be competitive or spar, or what did you used to get up to there? Oh, it, it started out that I really wanted to actually get in the ring and. And, and spar and fight. But then um, I realised that uh, I'm actually not a massive fan of getting punched in the head. I got <laughs> Nobody punched is. in the head a lot. <laughs> so uh, I, I found that, uh, I, yeah, I wasn't as good at it as what I would have liked to have been. Um, so that's, and then I, I gave it up for a while. And then I picked up, I started doing Krav Maga, um, which was really interesting. That's the Israeli martial arts. So, it was the one Just that was say, say that one again. It was called Krav Maga, K R A V. Yeah, Krav Maga, Krav Maga. I think it's got a few different pronunciations. Yep. yep. Um, but it was developed to be really simple, and it's 
it's quite aggressive though. It's a it's a much more self defensive martial arts. It's you know kick them in the balls, punch them in the throat, gouge an eye out, that sort of thing. Yep. Um, so I did it for a bit, which was fun because we'd get to use these big rubber AK forty sevens and these pretend knives, and you'd kind of disarm people. Um, but then gave it all, sort of stopped doing any real training for a while. And um, my cousin got me into jujitsu with a really cool club at Morningside in a little scout hall. It's called Level Five Jujitsu. And mm-hmm. the guy that uh, there's two guys that run it, Dave and, and Clay. And Dave's a um, he's a professor at Griffith University teaching like physiology and yep. he actually did the physiology just so he could learn how to do better jiu-jitsu right. um, so it's uh, but it's it's good in the sense that you can enjoy that martial arts without getting punched because there's no striking and, and kicking so for sooks like me it's great uh, but also good for the ground fighting for the MMA as you would know do you, do you like watching it on TV at all? I do. I love it. I mean, I don't. I don't. Um, I, I'm not disciplined enough with with remembering when the fights are on and things. But when um, I've got a mate that follow, he follows it religiously. So whenever there's like a, me, yep. a, yeah, it, when there's a decent fight on, he brings me and goes, "Mate, there's there's fights on. I bought it on main event. Come round, beers in the esky. We're watching it, and I love it. Um, I just wish I could be a little more disciplined and and sort of follow the follow the fighters better." Yeah, I guess you, I mean, I'm one of those sort of people, if I, once I sort of get into something, I really sort of get into it. Um, as I was, I go through, I've gone, I go through so many different phases when it comes to sport. Like, if I go back to, back to the late 80s or the early 90s, it was, it was all about English Premier League soccer. It was, <laughs> and then after that, it was the NBA. I used to, and still, I still love NBA to this day, NBA basketball, but, and then it was, um, you know, you go through different stages. It might have been ice hockey for a year, the NFL, you know, the baseball, different phases. Um, and then, obviously, the NRL, AF, AFL, still like the AFL. But I guess the UFC has probably been more the last four years, about four or five years, probably since since Rousey and Home uh, in Melbourne uh, in December 15. That's, well, November 15. That's what I really... Sort of got into it, and I've sort of been following it pretty closely ever since. But um, yeah, it's great to, to watch. I mean, I, I said I wouldn't like to be punched in the face. I mean, I'd like to I'd like to do a jiu-jitsu class. I mean, I love doing that. Um, I've been able to meet a couple of UFC fighters and have them as friends um, as a result of my interest in the UFC. Um, and I've been travelling. I've travelled to Auckland a couple of times to watch events. I've uh, and I've and I've seen it. You know, in Perth and Adelaide, so it's, it's great to, to watch live uh, as well. But um, it's just one of those things that are, are really, yeah, I'm hooked on it for now. We'll see if it, in five years' time, whether I'm still hooked on it or not. Uh, maybe, probably not, you know, if you sort of look at history, but uh, you just never know what's, what the next in thing is or what, what people sort of get, you know, sort of uh, get interested in. So, mate, if you get the inkling one day and you want to have a go at the jiu jitsu classes, um, oh, you live way up the north side, though, so it's pro- it's, it's probably not. I'll, I'll sort of live, we, I live about Windsor. We're about to see you at the moment. Oh, I've, I actually just shifted to Shala Park, so I've now moved to the south side. Got, but the gym's a fair, at um, a fair trip to Nudgee for golf. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's um, well, I, I was living just across the highway from the Nudgee golf. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah. Up, so it was convenient, but yeah, no, we sh- we shifted down here just with the house we've got now. It's got a bigger block of dirt and we've got a caravan and a couple of dogs and it's a bit more family friendly um but the the gym is at morningside um or belmont you know where the cemetery is um on the hill there at, on okay. Road. okay there's a yep. little scout hut in there yep. so um you should come along one other well you can't at the moment because we're all shut due to covid but you know, mm. post covid you should come along one day because the, the guys that all train there they're they're good in the sense that no one's there to try and be a hero. Like sort of more about yep. the learning and the experience than, you know, trying to be the guy that, um, that shows everyone up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's, 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 I enjoy it. Um, I enjoy that. So what, any other interests that we should know about Steve, anything else that, that sort of floats your boat at the moment? Uh, I have got a pilot's license and I wish I could fly more. Um, have you flown so, a plane? So how many times have you flown a plane? I've done about 
50 hours, I think. Um, so the average, actually probably slightly more than that. Um, the average is about 40 hours to get your license. So yep. as a kid, as a kid, I was in the Air Force cadets and was always going to be a, a fighter pilot. Like that's just, that was just what I was going to do. Um, but uh, the guidance counsellor at, at school failed to mention, and I probably could have researched it myself, it's not all her fault, but failed to mention that you need to do like top maths and physics. I did. I think I did maths B and maths C was the top and physics. So when I applied to uh, be a pilot in the Air Force, they said, well, I'm sorry, I have to get back to school for 12 months, which once you've just, when you just got out of school, it's like, oh, that's not happening. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but that. So I... Um, yeah, just um, yes, yeah, save my money from working for the for the parents, and I was flying a um, I was flying a plane at the time called a Skyfox Gazelle, which is almost an ultralight. It's like balsa wood, um, you know, ailerons and canvas instead of tin, and um, we're doing a um, we're doing a doing circuits at the Townsville Airport, which is a RAF controlled airport one day. And my instructor had been to a wedding the night before. And whilst he wasn't, like he was still a little bit dusty and hung over, and whilst he wasn't sort of in a state that he wasn't allowed to fly, because you've got to be, I think it's eight hours bottle the throttle to fly a plane, he, he still was a bit under the weather. And we're in this hot little cockpit flying at a thousand feet. And, um, you know, it's summertime in towns, also it's hot outside, it's hot inside. And he just looked at me and he said, mate, I'm really sorry. And then the smell hit. Um, so <laughs> in this tiny little plane, <laughs> so we're at a thousand feet flying past the tower and we've got the, the plastic golding doors of this little plane, like flapping in the breeze, trying to get the smell out of the cockpit. <laughs> and next thing, the, uh, the air traffic control is on, on the radio to us, keeping in mind, these are all RAF, RAF staff. And she's, oh, are you trying to signal us? Is everything okay? And he's looking at me and he's like, please, whatever you do, don't tell them what's happened. <laughs> Just tell them it's too hot or something. Um, but yeah, that's, um, flying is, it's, it's a ton of fun. And if anyone's interested, in it, I recommend they go and do it. It's really cool. It's been a while yeah. since you did that. When was the last time you were out doing that? Oh, I would have been before we moved back from Townsville, back to Brisbane. So it, um, when was that? That was like 2012 was the last time I flew. The prices, uh, with fuel prices going up, you know, the, the price of the um, hours in the plane went up a lot. Um, and I looked into doing it at Archerfield just to do some just some refresher hours. And I think it got up to like 400 bucks an hour with an instructor. So it was a bit price prohibitive. But um, yeah, it's certainly something I will get back into going forward. It's It's probably one of the most enjoyable things out of all my hobbies yeah okay well there you go i didn't know that, that you're sort of uh, into the to flying and enjoy doing that so that's quite cool um i think at the top of the show before we sort of uh, hit record um i think you said something about um you've been on sky news before have you, you or with that's that's with um belvedere or yeah so um before sky business news um was pulled from Foxtel and now I think Koshi has sort of started a, a channel up, a digital channel called Ausbiz TV. So if anyone's interested in shares, it's, mm. it's a good channel to have on your computer um, while you're working away during the day. But um, uh, yeah, they, they would ask us, Dave and I, to come on from time to time and just do little segments about different stocks, uh, the research that we'd done and sort of explain it to, to the viewers. That was that was fun. The first, um, the, there's actually a, a video, a quite funny video on my um, YouTube but the first time I did, did a set and you're in this little room and at um, the building at Bowen Hills there, the news, news court building, and there's a TV off to one side. Mm. And I'm looking at, as I'm looking at the camera, I could see myself on the TV in the corner. And so when I would, stop talking that tv wasn't looking at me it was looking at ingrid or nadine the two hosts i just mm. assumed that i wasn't on the camera so i'm like looking around and glancing to the side i'm watching this tv it, nervous as hell um but i didn't realize there's a delay so whilst the camera was well i thought the camera wasn't actually on me and i'm looking around and being nervous it was <laughs> so i caught plenty of flack on social media from mates about how uh, how nervous and untidy i looked at my first Sky Business News appearance. 
got easier though. Yeah, no, I'm sure it does. I just, just, I think I just found it on YouTube. I might have, to, might have a look. It says Village Roadshow Limited Top Golf. That, yeah, it could. That, that might have been one of the last ones I did. Um, okay. I'll see if I can find the. Um, I think I did probably I don't know four or four or five different different uh, you know crossovers and um, from the News Corp thing over time. But I'll see if I can find the the, the funny one and send that to you because it's quite a laugh. But yeah, that yeah. that was one of the ones I did on Village. Yeah, that's a couple of nearly two years ago. That one. Yeah, yeah. They they the Sky Business Channel kind of went through a well, bit I of a used brand to watch, change. I, I, did, I did used to like watching it. I really I did for a while back there. Probably not more so in recent years, but I did I did enjoy watching um, Sky Business News. Uh, it was well, I thought it was quite good. Um, there's one guy that I sort of followed there. Um, you may have heard, obviously, in the circles of financial, um, you know, management and planners and people that, you know, who know stocks or whatever. Uh, you may have come across Roger Montgomery. Yeah, yeah. I haven't. Uh, I've never met him face to face, but I remember him from the show. Yeah. Yeah. So he was on the show a few times. I always thought the guy was fairly intelligent, and uh, bought it. I think I bought it. Bought one of his, his book. Um, not that well, whenever it came out a few years ago. Um, that was quite interesting. Uh, valuable, I think it's called. Um, yeah, but he seems like an, an interesting guy. Um, what about any of sort of the other any other presenters on Sky News uh, in relation to to the you know obviously stocks and that that you sort of uh, get good research or good, get good intel from or respect? Uh, well, actually, I had a lot of time for the one of the hosts, a guy named James Dagan Nixon, who um, I think might have. Went to AFR when they when they rebranded rebranded Sky Business News, but um, yeah, I always found that he was really in touch with like the fact that he was a journalist, but was able to still maintain you know the um, um, coverage of all these different stocks was was I thought was a real testament to his intelligence and you know how committed he was to the job. Man. Mm. I guess having a knowledge and having research on, on lots of different stocks, it couldn't be an easy thing to, to sort of, uh, I guess, for a stockbroker, financial planner, to sort of keep abreast of. But um, obviously, the, the the information that's out there at the moment makes it a bit easier, doesn't it? The way we with technology uh, and different things that are going on, is there a bit? Obviously, there's a bit bit more to it than good technology, though, isn't there? There's obviously as you said, talking to people, getting a, a feel for what's going on out there is pretty important. Yeah, it's um, it's one of those things where I mean, for a for a stockbroker or anyone who's a fund manager, stock picker, so to speak, it's it can be a bit of a thankless job because if you do something, if you get one right, no one remembers, and if you get one wrong, no one forgets. So, um, but the um, okay. the the Inf access to information is a bit of a double-edged sword, so it can be, it, it can be really handy um, in that you know we've got access to information so quickly through the internet. But it also means that once upon a time, if if you would research the company and um, you know you thought something bad was going to happen, so you'd ring up your stockbroker and you'd say, "Hey, Fred, you know I'd like to sell these shares because you know I just heard on the news that this." Um, uh, this this potential problems occur and Fred would if it wasn't quite accurate he might say oh well that's not actually the case and xyz and I wouldn't sell those shares you know maybe just hang on to them whereas now people just sort of shoot first and research later so we get these big swings in stock prices um, and then of course you've got the issue of well what information's correct and what's not so mm. that's that's why whilst what? we so I've always, um, I've always found it, uh, and that's obviously part of what, what you're just saying there, but I just find it's fascinating that there's just such a, you know, people just are trigger happy when it comes to buying and selling shares. It's not, it just seems to be a, sh a bit of sheep mentality, a bit of, um, there's not, everyone seems to be coming to the same sort of conclusions for whatever reason. And as a result, at the same time, and as a result, selling off, Prices go up, prices go down, and it fluctuates quite dramatically. And it's mm. to me, it, it's you know, 
it, why does it, so is it even going to not be like that? It just seems like it's been like that, you know, forever and a day that there's always these different swings going on. I think we can blame the liquidity and the low transaction costs on that because, you know, you think if, if you're buying and selling a house, you've yeah. got thousands. It's going to cost you to get in yeah. and out. Mm. Yeah. And um, whereas with a share, you go, okay, well, look, it's going to cost me 20 bucks. I'll sell it now. And then, you know, maybe later I'll buy it back or I may not. Um, yeah. yeah. Or I'll buy on a whim. And if I get it wrong, well, I'll just take the loss and sell it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's really going to change in mm. the medium term. But what I do think is, is if you've got, if you've got the time and the inclination and the patience to do the research at. properly yep. and, and buy these, buy these companies as if you are, forget that you're buying a share on, on the exchange and just think about, I'm actually buying a piece of a business yep. um, and exactly. treat it that way. You can, you can profit from those, that volatility in the sense that when everyone's selling off on a whim, you can go, well, I actually know that this is going to be okay. So I'll just buy it here and sell it for two or three years and everything will be good. Mm. Yeah, mate, some, there's been some pretty good insights into in, into these discussions that we've had here. So it's been been quite good. But uh, anything else, any other stories that you wanted to sort of bring up or any, any other interests that you'd like to share? Um, you know, what does is, what is a long weekend look like for you in uh, isolation? <laughs> um, well, the, the Easter weekend, we, we unpacked the caravan in the backyard and um, the... Um, we pretended to go camping, so that was our <laughs> that was our isolation. We had a little fire in the backyard, and okay. it was pretty good. But um, but I think this weekend's going to be far quieter. Maybe try and get a surf in. The surf's the surf's two to three foot and perfect, so it's the time to be doing it. Hang on, did you say surfing? Yeah, did I not mention that? <laughs> no, no, or whatever. I didn't know that was another hobby that we didn't know about. But um, surfing. So where would you go surfing uh, on the weekend if you were going to go? Most um, most times I catch up with a mate that lives just near Main Beach. So our sure, preferred it. yeah preferred spots are Main Beach near the uh, near the gymnasium there that's on the beach, just across the road from SeaWorld, yeah. um, or um, uh, Chugan's another good spot. Chugan's one of my favourites, or uh, Kingscliff. Mm. Try to steer away from the points. It's too many people, and I'm too much of a Gumby surfer, so I just get in everyone's way. So is Shayla Park within 50 kilometres of Main Beach? Yes, it is. I checked it on the app, thankfully. <laughs> I checked it on Google Maps to see. Um, so, because we're just near the hyperdome, so it's just on the highway and you're there. It's actually good being on this side of town from a surfing perspective. What about Burley? Is that too far away? <laughs> yeah, well, Burley, um, no, I actually don't know. I have to check, but Burley's, um, uh, Burley gets a bit busy. One of the, um, earlier, earlier this year, I did a trip over to Papua New Guinea for a surfing trip. We went to a place called Tapira, which is about three hours drive in the back of a truck down a bumpy dirt road north of Madang. And um, I tell you, if you ever wanted to know what paradise looked like, that's it. Just the yeah. absolute magic part of the world. <laughs> what do you think is the, um, of all the, do you, is it stand up you're doing or bodyboarding? No, it was just, just normal old surfing. So um, stand up, yeah. Um, yeah, stand up surfing. Okay, yeah, that's that's good. Just checking. Uh, yeah, right on fifty k is pretty much from where you are to surface. So is it? <laughs> probably get away with that one, I'd say, but you probably wouldn't get far any further. <laughs> but Sneak not, in under the radar, just. Yeah, probably. Depends. Yeah, it all depends where you go, I guess, but. Yeah, that's that's. Um, what do you think of this 50k thing? Do you reckon that's going to get lifted in the next couple of weeks, or what? Do, what do you? It's, it's hard I feel to like know. It, well, I feel like it sort of has to. I mean, we've got. Um, I've, I've been watching checking the, Anast Yeah, watching the updates from Anastasia Palaszczuk, and I think the last few days we've had zero new cases. So yeah, um, like I get what they're saying, and that if we all sort of, um, you know, start running back to pubs and things, then it could. Just to kick off again. It's not many, I don't know if there's a lot of instances. I mean, when you look at the numbers, we already had 
at the end of March, we already had well over 800 in Queensland alone. And we've only hitting a fair, just over hitting a thousand since it started. So we only had 200 cases from in the last month, 200 new cases in the last month, all the ones that have obviously from March have either died or recovered. Mm. Um, so it doesn't appear like there's a lot of active cases in Queensland. There might be a hundred active cases or something. It's not, it's not like there's a lot, um, but yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, and, it, and to me, that's surprising. It's really surprising that we've been able to, been able to, to, um, to have those low numbers. I mean, it's, it's quite fascinating, but I think most people, I spoke to Robert uh, this, earlier this morning about this, and, most people that do seem to be doing the right thing. There's always going to be dickheads out there, and I think we've been lucky that the dickheads haven't caused too much damage. Yeah, I tend, I tend to agree with you. And when you think about the statistical probability of it, if there's, you know, I, I don't know the population numbers, but how many people live in Queensland? And if there's, you know, it's like five mil. Yeah, and so the odds of the odds of bumping into one of those six million people which happens to be, you know, was it 800 active cases or something? So out of 6 million people, you got to bump into one of those 800 to get sick. And you would imagine that most of the people are in quarantine now. So... Well, that's right. So they've obviously... And then they've, they've been able to trace it quite well where these people have gone. You've got downloading this app now. It's, it's sort of all helping to, to, try to, keep, to try to keep things squashed, I guess. So I don't know. It's hard to know when restaurants are going to be open again. But, uh, you know, sport, we've been... Hanging out for AFL, we've been hanging out for NRL, uh, golf. I don't think they've been playing any golf uh, professionally. That is, um, but you know, it's good that the golf course, the golf clubs are back open again. Um, when was the last time you played a game? Just recently, or? Yeah, I had a little hit at Nudgy with a friend um, late last week. Took the afternoon off, and um, we went and played. Went and played 18, and it wasn't awful either, uh, which is surprising given how long it's been. What, um, just out of curiosity, though, just reverting back, what do you yeah. think of that? What are your thoughts on that app? Uh, I don't really think about too much, to be honest. I'm not sort of, it's just like anything. It's just uh, another app on your phone, you know. It's, mm -hmm. There's a lot of apps already on your phone. It's just another one. Uh, is it going to be helpful? They say it is. They say it is. I mean, they. Uh, and a lot of people wouldn't have downloaded it if, um, if there wasn't a lot of trust in what's happening in Australia when it comes to to, I think what, what's happened over the last month is the trust that seems to have been uh, built back a bit when it comes to the government and mm. um, in relation to the to the bit of luck, I guess with um, with uh, not being able to have a, a large number of infections, um, but they obviously got <clears throat> they did quite a lot of good things that made that that certainly helped uh, that luck as well. Um, and obviously you look at a lot of these other countries, they should have contained it a lot better, but they never did. Um, you know, America's probably the case in point there that uh, they had plenty of time to be able to sort it out and they couldn't get on top of it from a very early, from a very early stages, you know. Uh, it mm. spread like, um, I guess you could, you could compare the spread of the virus over there to, how the bushfire spread, you know, here last year that it affected such large areas of the of the um, our country. You can yeah. probably look at it like that. That's that's an interesting way of looking at it. But we, we were devastated by bushfires, and America are devastated by this coronavirus. In when you're looking at the number of people that have died from it, and you're looking at the number of people that that have got it, over a million well, people they, in America, which is one in every three hundred, have had it. Yeah. Actually, at one point, I read something that said that there was one person dying every 15 minutes in New York. And well, that's, that, would, that would be right, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's incredible numbers when you think about it. Um, it's quite scary, really. You know, I just, I raised the app because, um, you know, I've been hearing from people, so people are saying to me, oh, don't download it, Steve. You know, they're, they're tracking your data and they're tracking where you are and what you're doing. But then I sort of think, well, I'm sure they've got, more important and interesting people to track than me. And even if they did want to track me, surely they could do it, like you said, through one of the other countless apps that I've got on my phone that are allowed to use tracking Social, data. Yeah, and, social media leaves footprints, you know, all that sort of stuff at the end of the day. Mm, absolutely. So, yeah, it's... Um, uh, so unless, guess, you're not, unless you're not using a computer, unless you're not using your phone, you know, you're, and there's, as, as they said, there's 15 million people regularly using... Um, 
their phones for, for leaving a footprint, you know, and there's 10 million that of the Australians, for whatever reason, they're too young, they're too old, the they don't care, you know, there's that. So there's quite a huge percentage of people that are exposing their cells anyway when it comes to uh, leaving their footprints. Mm, I suppose too, it's, it's a small price to pay to get back to, you know, normal life again quicker, isn't it? I think, um, I think everyone's a bit tired of being cooped up at home. Yeah, definitely, mate. Definitely. Um, I don't think that's... I don't have too much more. Probably going to cut it off pretty soon. Uh, Steve, it's been over an hour since we started chatting, believe it or not. It's just hit this sort of hour mark, but um, it's certainly been good to catch up with you uh, over a Zoom call and uh, and be a guest on the podcast. Um, we've, we've spoken about it a few times over the last year uh, coming on as a guest. So thank you very much for uh, coming on. And uh, I guess um, it's great to hear some a new, I guess a completely new perspective uh, when it comes to the podcast, um, yeah. No, th- thanks for having me. I was, yeah, excited. As soon as I got, when I got your message, I was really excited to come on. So no, I very much appreciate it. And it's been good chatting with you. And hopefully, um, hopefully once this, this COVID stuff disappears, we can catch up and have a hit of golf or something at some point. Yeah, de- definitely need to play a game of golf sometime this year together, mate, I tell you. We need to, we need to do that if we can. And, uh, uh, or, you know, invite me to an event or vice versa, one that's going to be appropriate, you know, an appropriate sort of time frame and, and, uh, and hopefully something good will come out of it. You know, it might, might be, um, I don't know, but we just, we just got to skip through and, and see yeah. what it looks like over the next few months. That's for sure. Uh, keep, keep it real mate. And, uh, and keep safe and all the best to you and your family going forward. And, uh, we'll get this uploaded, uh, shortly, shortly after I've stopped recording. So, and, uh, it'll be on YouTube. Uh, pod, it'll be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, share on Facebook if you want. Get all your friends like Kieran, I'll chase him up and see if I can get him as a guest. But uh, yeah, do that. No worries, mate. Take it easy. No worries. Thanks, mate. Talk to you soon. Yeah.